Sorry, he's going to speak for about 10 minutes on topics related to the theme of this panel. Uh, the topic I've chosen to talk about is internet literature and state regulation of publishing in post-socialist China. Uh, and you know, this is based on research I've been doing over the past 10 years or so, looking at literature published on the internet in China. Uh, and the first question I always get asked is then why literature is a very marginal, completely irrelevant aspect of today's life. Well, maybe it is, but maybe not so much in China. Look at these statistics from 2011, from the official statistics from the China Internet Network Information Center. Why do people go online in the PRC? Well, 80.9% for instant messages, 79.4% for search engines, and so on and so forth. But then this really interesting category, online literature, or one more literature in Chinese, also 39.5%. More people go online in China to read literature than to do online shopping. <laughs> That's always a good talk also to give to students who want to study literature. Uh, it's a good sales pitch. Um, it's interesting for another reason as well, because why has CNNIC created this regulatory category of online literature as a specific category of a type of website that you can actually keep statistics about? And that has something to do with the Chinese government's response to certain things that are going on in literature on the internet and that uh, are significant to Chinese media and Chinese publishing as a whole. Um, so before I go into that, just briefly uh, talking about rebalancing. There's a lot of rebalancing to be done when it comes to actually doing research on the internet in China. This graphic shows you the topics of interest of people doing research on the Chinese internet in the USA, in China, in Hong Kong, and the UK. Um, and the remarkable thing about this is that if you look at the green bars there, that by far the largest percentage of studies on the Chinese internet done by people in the US and the UK are to do with politics. And about 90% of those are to do with the question whether or not the internet can bring democracy to China. Um, and you know, this is obviously an important question, but it's also an example of a great lack of balance. It is almost as if researchers in the US and in the UK are inclined to only to research on those aspects of the internet that they feel should be important for people in China based on their based on their understanding of what Chinese people should want. And so people doing research on this in the US and the UK, they don't look so much at what Chinese people actually do on the internet, they look at what they think they should be doing. And I think there's a, there's a significant problem there and rebalancing is necessary. And that's why it's good to look at aspects of, for instance, creative economy and creative expression online. So this is what it's all about. Now many of you will know this website, Xidia, uh, or Starting Point, uh, which at some point in time, not so long ago, was one of the top 100 most visited websites in the world, and remains to be one of the top 200 most visited websites in China and in Taiwan. And what this provides is online commercial fiction, popular fiction, the kind of fiction that if you want to buy it in the UK, you usually buy it at a train station, you read it on the train and you go away again. Right? Genre fiction, romance, martial arts, historical, and so on and so forth. Right? Very, very long novels that are serialized, that go on and on and on, 200 chapters, 300 chapters, really nice, juicy stories, you can get addicted to them, and actually a lot of people do get addicted to them, uh, because when you finish the first 100 chapters, you often hit a paywall, and you have to start paying, you have to become a <laughs> VIP, right? <laughs> you continue reading these things, right? And you can take out a subscription, and this is how these websites make money, and how these authors make money. Why is this important? Well, as many of you will know, Publishing in China is still 
to a very large extent something that relies on whether or not you can get the so-called official book number, the shu right? It's very difficult to bring out a printed book in China without such a number. So here we have people is working for completely commercial ventures on the internet that are bringing out full-length novels, the size of books, if not longer, without book numbers. So this is something that cannot yet happen in print, which is happening very, very regularly on the internet. Uh, and the office in charge of regulating online publishing has responded to this by saying, OK, we are not going to try to regulate this the same way as print. We are going to regulate this by giving certificates to these websites, whereby they promise that they will adhere to certain standards of editing, censorship, and so on and so forth. But we're not going to give specific permissions to numbers to every single book that's published. We simply cannot manage that. And so it's an important readjustment of the state regulation system for publishing in response to what is going on online. And that is why we see internet literature coming out as a statistic of <coughs> types of websites that people visit, because there is such a category within the regulation of the internet as well. So it's a, it's a potential breakthrough in the control of publishing in China that is, that is taking place under the influence of um, online Creativity. The other reason why this is, is significant is because it pushes another type of rebalancing forward. Because, of course, not all these websites, not all these novels write about very innocent romantic love stories. Some of them are pornographic. Uh, uh, and if you talk about the internet, you have to talk about pornography. Um, so I'll do that as well. The organizers really hope to do that. So I'll do that just very quickly. Um, so, the other type of regulation that is emerging is this regulation of so-called websites that distribute pornographic uh, content, and they're all fiction. If you would make a list like that in the UK, probably it would all be video. Um, <laughs> in China, they are fiction. Uh, so, I went and asked the... Uh, official in charge of this in China, well, how do you make these decisions? You're a novel, fiction, you know, it's creative, sometimes it's about sex, but how can you tell it's all plastic? Well, who makes those decisions? Certainly not you, and you're not you're a civil servant, what do you know about this? <laughs> and he sort of sighed and he said, you know, it is really a problem, because if only we had a system like in the West, where if you're 18 years or over, it's all fine. But our government doesn't believe in that. We believe in the perspective of ideology that no person in China should be confronted with this kind of material. Right. So this is a remnant of the socialist mindset whereby the government actually has the responsibility to tell all of its people what it should or should not be coming in contact with. Right. It's, it's, a remnant, it's one of the very few remnants of socialism in China. It sounds Ironic that you know, what socialists about the Chinese government now is that they ban pornography, um, but it does seem to come down. Um, and here too, rebalancing is taking place. And this might be a more important rebalancing in the long run than the one that's about book numbers and, and publishing permits. Um, first of all, some people are trying to get around these regulations by publishing in telegraph codes. Uh, although it's very, very easy on the internet to translate telegraph code into Chinese characters, I don't think this is going to go very far. Uh, but what's more interesting, if you look at, if you go back here, if you look at the number one website that appears on these blacklists, Facebook, which are full on, you can look them up on your smartphone. Um, <laughs> they have actually now launched a smartphone app. So, you can, so forget about the World Wide Web, send the pornography straight into your phone. Um, and the nice thing about that is that by distributing the smartphone app through the Apple App Store, it has to come with a label saying this is 18 years or over. Uh, so the regulatory system of, sort of basically Western companies like Apple is being embraced by these Chinese producers themselves. 
because it actually helps them to make their work legal. Uh, and that might be the beginning of a rebalancing of this general sort of post-socialist mindset that the government should tell people what to read and what not to read, regardless of their age. Right. So I'll, I'll keep it at that for now, uh, and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, very interesting, Professor. Hawks know more about China's uh, online literature than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the most uh, direct effect of your presentation is encouraging more people to study Chinese harder. <laughs> <laughs> In order to read those kind of the interesting, fascinating uh, in the, uh, novels. And also, you probably you create, you create a lot of the uh, clicks for those uh, websites. Okay, yeah, uh, let me start my um, very brief uh, presentation. Um, I am the editor-in-chief of Forbes China. Um, uh, this uh, magazine, and, uh, as well as uh, ForbesChina.com, is the license from the uh, Forbes America. So um, I'm, not, I'm not an employee of the Forbes, but I am the, uh, uh, the, uh, the manager of the... Uh, Local company, uh, which uh, have the, uh, uh, which is the licensee of the uh, Forbes brand. So we kind of sort of the independent editorially and uh, uh, the in business side, we are relatively independent from the Forbes America. But um, uh, we have an agreement. We have to be in line with the uh, some standard, some value, and the layout. This kind of standard, we have to be the. Uh, under the, 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 the same brand. Um, you know, a lot of people might have known that the Forbes is uh, uh, focused on the uh, entrepreneurship, on the uh, innovation, technology, as well as the uh, uh, wealth creation and man management. So uh, we are in line with this, um, the value in uh, Forbes China. Uh, so today I'm going to, um, uh, let me walk you through China's uh, media industry by um, technology and internet. Uh, Professor uh, Hawks has uh, given you uh, uh, very detailed uh, the statistics of China's uh, uh, the uh, uh, internet the population. Um, half of China's population are internet users, and uh, most of whom are mobile users. The number still increases uh, very fast and many of them are mobile-only users. They are native to internet and very open to new technology-enabled products, services, and applications, especially media. Uh, nowadays, news are mostly read by mobile phones, and most of major news applications are non-state-owned. In the real world, only state institutions are allowed to run media, but the game is changing in the online world. Now, media are mostly for now me new media are mostly first developed or launched by private companies or individuals, be it a website, a blog, a social media account, an application a sharing platform, or a data mining tool. The older supply chain of news, content, and information has been disrupted and reshaped. News and information follow social, work, social network instead of traditional delivery channels. And China's successful online media, social media, and, and news apps are all non-state-owned. <coughs> Chinese readers are enabled by those technological tools. Most of the new media are not allowed to report news, but the content are increasingly user-driven. <coughs> they not only generate the contents, but also decide the uh, headlines by clicks, likes, comments, and follows. 
technology and the internet bring worse time and best time of media in China. The worst time is in that print and other old media are declining. Under a rigid regime, messages just do not deliver. The best time is in that new media, new ways of communicating emerge and succeed. Users' demand for diversified sources of news and opinions is increasing. And there are, there are a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation in media sector. From business side, China's media industry is pretty exciting. If we look beyond the news industry, TV shows, movies, internet, and uh, online literature, internet games, and other entertaining contents are exploding. You can find a lot of high growth companies in TMT field. TMT is a highly innovative, creative, and incentive industry. State sector just cannot compete. So from the business side, you can find a declining and a slow growth sector, a mostly, a mostly state-owned. And the rising and fast growth sector are virtually private sector. This is a kind of the media revolution, my understanding. But the state sector prefers evolution or co-revolution. The government mindset is to keep control and strengthen its soft power. Some government organs have been established to extend its regulation, the authorities' regulation over media from offline to online. And the state sector is adapting to new media dynamics. The government has encouraged its mouthpieces to make use of internet and create new media. The authority even, let me give you an example. The government even appointed an Olympic ping pong champion to lead a search engine project. Turns out to be a burning money project in the field. Some cash-rich SOE media acquire new media, such as successful game companies from private sector. <coughs> In short, this is a process from tech and internet is enablement to expression empowerment. I'm not sure if it is a power shift or a power redistribution or a state and non-state power ecosystem. I'm sure that there are a lot of fun to watch and a lot of opportunities to start up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I wish to join those who spoke before me and also at the plenary um, in thanking the organizers of this uh, China Development Forum for inviting me to be part of this distinguished panel to talk about China's media. Uh, I represent Phoenix T Television Group. Uh, I'm sure many of your audience are aware of it. Uh, which is perhaps the only private Chinese TV media uh, network operating extensively inside mainland China and beyond. Headquartered in Hong Kong and uh, listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange, we have six channels, including the European channel PCNE, of which I am managing director, a digi digital media network separately listed in New York Stock Exchange, as well as radio, outdoor, billboards, publication, education, uh, and cultural uh, businesses. And by and large, as a Hong Kong company, we have managed to maintain our editorial independence. 
and the way we collect news, produce programs, and carry out our daily broadcast does seem to have made a difference to the media landscape in China in the past 18 years. So my uh, brief remark today will be on reporting China as seen both from inside China and particularly from outside China as perceived by people like you. Now, to begin with, I'd like to start with some objectives which are in themselves um, potentially conflicting. Now, from a general point of view, media organizations desire that their stories about any country, particularly about China, uh, be informative, timely, fair, balanced, and not objective. It is vitally important that reporters and the, top and the editors constantly remind themselves not to be limited to stories that appeal to a certain group of constituents, but to serve the general public. In China, the objectives may be very different because the government expect media to not only to report on what's going on, but also to be informative about government policies and to be conducive to stability and to be supportive of the leadership at various levels of government. And of course, such objectives change over time to keep pace with the uh, uh, new developments, such as social media and, uh, and so on. Another government objective for those at least engaged in international broadcasts and uh, publications is to tell good stories about China. You've all heard about Hao uh, Shengyin and Hao uh, Gushi, right? And make China's voice heard. And in general, contribute to improving China's image internationally. It is seen as an important part of a campaign for what they call soft power. So as a result, uh, let's be brutally frank about it, Chinese media are often torn between serving the government in promoting the general principles of the party and the government and policy objectives and the priorities at a given time on the one hand and monitoring problems and uh, finding out difficulties and failures through investigative journalism on the other hand. So media, of course, tend to push the envelopes in China as anywhere else in the world. But then the wisdom tends to be that you mustn't charge too far ahead to test the level of the pain of the government. So the gap and the conflict potentially are there. Now, what is the perception of what's going on in, in the media scene in China, which may not be very, uh, very much the same as what's happening in reality? Admittedly, there is a gap between perception and reality. That's why all the problems and the questions. It is widely recognized that there has been an explosion of media activities in China in the past decade, fueled particularly by digitalization of TV networks and the huge increase of users of social media. On the other hand, the perception in the West, like in the UK, for instance, persists that just because China is a one-party system and does not operate by Western norms in such areas as human rights, democratic elections, and uh, and rule of law, that China's media are therefore tightly controlled by the state, and that there is no room for freedom of information. I throw that question to you, because that's basically the perception prevalent in the West. 
and of course is fueled by Western coverage of China. From time to time, one would read on Western media such horror stories as women's forced abortions, police harassment of Tibetans, and embezzlement of government funds by top officials. And Liu Xiaopo and uh, Ai Weiwei certainly hit international headlines. And we can discuss that later, if you want. And there is a perce perceived lack of military transparency that has caused resentment among China's neighbors. There is also the belief, and possibly true, as uh, uh, Professor Joe just now mentioned, a polarization that social media are principally a platform for the public to swap real information and to air their uh, grievances, whereas government media serve as tools of official propaganda. Now, one window for the outside world to inform itself about China, about Chinese media in particular, is through CCTV, foreign language broadcasts. And CNC from Xinhua, and such publications as Global Times and China Daily. Now, here the impression is mixed, admittedly, and the response fairly indifferent. They are perceived as too official and uh, subjective, and one would suggest might be too dogmatic, just one way. And one, of course, cannot help noticing that China daily is somewhat tilted towards economic and business stories and shy away from sensitive political issues. If you pick up any issue of uh, English China daily, you will notice that. Now, what is the reality? I will venture to suggest that it uh, really depends on one's point of view as to whether the bottle is half empty or half full. As I see it, this is a dynamic process, and things are changing and evolving as we speak. I'm not sure it's a revolution, but certainly it's still evolving as we speak, a very fast pace. Of course, we still have not seen a proper media legislation, a media law or liable law. And the line between objectivity and social responsibility, between news and official secret, is a fine one. And CCTV news bulletins seem to maintain their usual format of dispensing with official lines. On the other hand, there is so much change on the ground that those views and biases on China's lack of true news and, and the policy transparency may soon become obsolete. Is it too optimistic? I don't know. Indeed, there is hardly anything one cannot find out about what's going on in China. Of course, like <clears throat> anywhere else in the world, one needs to take what one hears or reads with a pinch of salt, particularly if you hear it from Beijing's taxi drivers. <laughs> right? The government does see advantage of using social media to promote its own messages. And this is something I'd like to draw your attention to because people tend to believe that social media are only for privately owned businesses. And the government shies away, controls, regulates it, and try to suppress it. But if you look at uh, CCTV stories, there is much, as much interactivity between the presenter and the viewer through social media as there is between the presenter and the viewership in Phoenix Info News, for instance. Furthermore, in the wake of new digital cable networks technology, the number of TV channels at the fingertips of individual household members has increased tremendously to some 200, some, some say 300 including practically all the international broadcasters such as BBC, CNN, HBO, and Eurosports. I was pleasantly surprised last time I was in China to see Eurosports and BBC and HBO uh, in, my, in my TV at home. Now, one key 
to understanding China's government approach to media is through the prism of me market economy. Now, media are no longer exclusively at the beck and call of the government as a tool of propaganda. They are also fundamentally a very key sector for driving growth in China's economy. There is still quite a lot of uh, control in the regulation, admittedly, but media must also be allowed to operate according to commercial rules and to make money through advertising and box office sales. And here we are not talking only about TV, but also newspapers, periodicals, flashy fashion magazines, uh, performing arts, fine arts, and cinema. All these are closely connected with China becoming the next consumption superpower. And you all know that media compete ferociously for viewers and sponsorships in China, just as they are anywhere else in the world. And Chinese social networks are ablaze side by side with e-commerce giants, as Alibaba, somebody mentioned, and express delivery agents. Presumably, the government holds them at the barrel and can shut the system down overnight. But there is hardly any economic incentive for doing so, as much as there is any desire to end Chinese consumerism. So in terms of China's international media, I'm pretty sure that there is a ready recognition of the structural problems built into the system for government-funded media, and that CCTV and others are gradually catching up with reality. International media are naturally an extension of their domestic operations, with more or less the same mentality, same skill sets, and same limitations in cross-cultural communications. If we cannot expect a revolution to happen to media content for the consumption of domestic audience, still less, I would caution, can we expect a fast change across language, political, and cultural boundaries when China's media go global. Now, in conclusion, I wish to wind up by suggesting a few points for future development. One, to put China's own house in order, including media legislation, as I mentioned, so that all media organizations can bow by the rule of law. While economic power is indispensable, a higher moral ground is also essential in getting others to pay attention. Understanding of the differences in each other can help, but to be taken seriously and to command trust and admiration and to make a difference in international media scene may be all different ball game. At the end of the day, we need in China deeper social change over longer periods to cultivate cultural values hospitable to the rule of law, protection of minority interests, and transparency of governance. Two, China's media should continue to grow. I think especially international broadcasters and publications are just too limited. And to penetrate into all corners of the society and beyond. In the course of doing that, they may introduce changes to make themselves stronger. And proactive in line with international norms and the professional standards. In time, China will grow into a media power to be reckoned with. This is part of the rebalancing, but not yet. So far, China's international media tend to be centralized, but I would venture to say that a good deal may be accomplished if regional and private media are allowed to play a role, commensurate, commensurate with the diversity of the society. Three, to introduce a more active conversation between China and international media organizations. Chinese reporters and editors should engage with their Western counterparts in meaningful exchanges to learn about each other's way of doing things. I recognize Hugo is here. He's doing a wonderful job in training Chinese media in interaction with international media organizations. I think it's very useful and important. Because international communication is not a one-way street. It should be a dialogue, not a monologue. 
right? It should be a convergence of views, not export of ideas and ideologies. One notices that there are few Chinese in annual media gatherings, such as news exchange, and organizations such as Frontier Club in London. You hardly see any Chinese there. They should do more. Equally, organizations such as European Broadcast Union in Geneva should open their doors to Chinese media. So let me stop here and thank you very much for your attention and welcome questions. So there's a PowerPoint. And uh, my name is Raymond Lee. I come from the uh, Chinese service of the BBC. Uh, as you may know, actually, uh, BBC Chinese service is one of uh, 28 language services at the BBC. Uh, and right now, we are running two websites. One is uh, bbcchinese.com, which uh, offers uh, news information on a 24 by 7 basis. And the other is uh, bbcukchina.com, actually targeting at people like you, young students and young professionals, uh, which is also offering a lot of information about UK life or your study life here in the UK. Uh, today, uh, each of us has been asked to uh, talk about our you know, observation uh, on media revolution in China. Uh, I have to say, I think it's quite an uh, impossible task to accomplish. Uh, so I will try my best to use the uh, next 10 minutes to highlight some of my observations on the Chinese media industry over the uh, last 12 months. First of all, I mean, there's no need for us to uh, talk about China, given the huge population, the most popular uh, country in the world, it has become the largest media market. Uh, in the world. However, uh, perhaps uh, not all of us know China is also the largest new media market in the world. Well, according to the latest uh, you know, uh, official figures, we know actually by the end of uh, last year, um, China actually got 680 million users with a penetration of 45.8% in terms of uh, you know, online population in proportion to the total population. Secondly, also in terms of mobile internet, we got 500 million users in China, again, which is the largest number in the world. And thirdly, in terms of social media, um, we know as we got uh, you know, the instant messaging users, including, of course, Weibo, WeChat, so on and so on, we got uh, uh, 532 meters by the end of the last year. And another thing, I guess uh, maybe some of you have been using, yeah, using the internet to do shopping. Yeah. I was quite amazed when I, whenever when I went to China, and uh, amazed by the fact that there's so many people in China uh, almost buying everything online. And uh, quite amazing. Uh, I mean, of course, we, we, we have a very, I would say, uh, popular e-shopping here in the UK. But then compared with China, I would say it's nothing. <laughs> um, I think some of you should remember every year on 11th of November. Uh, I don't know how many of you have taken part in that, uh, you know, kind of a spending uh, crazy moment. Um, well, I'm, of course, the figure actually I uh, got it from CNIC report, uh, you know, just released uh, last month. Meanwhile, in terms of uh, media consumption in China, I would say yes, it has, uh, you know, like the other speakers said, is changing significantly or completely, uh, you know, uh, different from the before. First of all, and uh, even Mr. Joe and other speakers also mentioned about. Now, new media are replacing digital media as the most important source of news information for many people in China, I think including many of us in this room as well. I think every day 
we spend a lot of time actually browsing our Weibo account or our WeChat account for news information before actually browsing the news website or news portal website. <coughs> Secondly, I think again, social media uh, is uh, very often the first source of information. I mean, not only just for ordinary <coughs> people, also for uh, you know, people like me, the journalist. I think journalists in China and outside China, uh, for those who are covering China stories, I mean, very often, we are the same. We go to social media as the first source for news information. And then, of course, we will then verify and do our investigation, whatever. But then, very often, that's the first source of information. Mobile devices, I think uh, Mr. Zhou also mentioned that. And uh, that's uh, also true in China as well. <coughs> Um, although we could say, um, according to the latest uh, uh, survey, TV is still uh, the most popular uh, you know, platform for news information at home. And then print media. Uh, actually, I don't know how many of you know, over last year, actually, lots of uh, print media organizations in China were facing problems, uh, huge challenges. I mean, for two things. One is they are losing readers, and uh, quite uh, significantly. And then more importantly, for their survival, they are losing advertisers. Yeah. Even I just looked at uh, the last you know, quarters of the year. Uh, advertising revenue by print media and uh, in China dropped by another 9%. Yeah. So actually, over the last uh, few months, uh, because actually I spent the last few months in Hong Kong as a visiting scholar, and then during the time I've been invited by quite a number of newspapers in China to give a talk. And very often I was asked to talk about transformation of business model, and uh, you know, how uh, new uh, traditional media in China, how they can change themselves to cope with the challenges of new media. So in a way, I can sense and feel the real pressure uh, among many print media in China. However, <coughs> I would say the media control and censorship over the year, uh, over the last uh, 12 months in China, I'm afraid, I have to say, are getting tougher. <coughs> yeah, that's my observation, of course. Um, right now, I don't know whether you know or not, uh, in this month, and next month, there are 250,000 journalists uh, in China from 6,778 uh, 6, news organizations in China across the country are taking the first ever nationwide exams. And um, the whole exam covers six parts. I, I mean, as you can imagine, that would cover uh, news ethics, uh, about uh, uh, news regulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there are two things uh, in that sense, very ideological or political. One is called Marxist news values. The other is called socialism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> well, uh, for those who don't know China, uh, actually in China, if you want to be a reporter. Uh, can be you know, reporting uh, stories or news, you need to get report passes. Okay? So this exam uh, is a must for all the journalists in China uh, to get new reporter passes. If you can't you know, uh, pass the exam by the end of uh, February, uh, actually I, I was told the result will, uh, will be announced in March, then you need to retain the exam. Uh, so effectively, you shouldn't be um, reporting as a reporter until you get that pass. Yeah. That's the first thing. Secondly, uh, recently, there was a, 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 I would say, move by the government uh, saying that the top 10 um, you know, uh, journalism institute in China um, the dean of that should be held by party officials. Yeah. And, uh, well, 
uh, if you know right now, some of the uh, you know the journalism institutes, uh, top journalism institutes in China, the dean of that is already held by retired government officials. But now they are talking about current uh, you know government officials. Yeah. Um, again, uh, in China we know uh, traditionally uh, in the past. There were a number of, um, I would say, uh, relatively outspoken media organizations in China. Unfortunately, I think over the last year, almost all of them were also facing quite huge pressure. Actually, the picture I just shows now is the training menu for execs. It's about, well, actually, they got uh, two uh, volumes and uh, actually more than 700 pages. Yeah. So for those of who you know, take the exams in you know, journalists, they need to go through this. Yeah. And also along with this, there is also a six episode of video teaching materials as well to go along. All this will be provided by the government free. <laughs> and uh, I, I was told that uh, so nearly uh, 200,000 copies uh, will be circulated to all the media, all media organizations. So it's a really, really a big, big move. Yeah. Well, this is a guy, uh, Yin Minghua, and uh, actually uh, he was uh, you know, appointed uh, early last month as the new dean of journalism at Funan University. Yin Minghua, the, the gentleman on the right hand side, actually he is the current president of a Jiefang Daily News Group, a newspaper group in Shanghai. Jiefang Daily is the official newspaper of a local branch of Shanghai's Communist Party. So, in the way, I don't know, try to prove that uh, you know, the, the new way of uh, you know, kind of appointing uh, the deans of journalism has started already. Yeah. Well, I think we all remember last year the New Year message incident. And happened to Southern Weekly. Yeah? And on the left hand side, that was the original version of the New Year message written by the journalists at the newspaper, Southern Weekly. But then, because of the interference, and then the change into the, you know, the, the version on the right hand side, obviously, the, on the left hand side, the, the theme of the article was talking about, well, we talk about the China dream. It should be the dream of constitutional governance. And I think that's the tone or theme of the original New Year message, or original draft. On the right-hand side, the, the new version and, uh, uh, becomes like a more sort of pro-government tone. Uh, so it, well, the title of it says, we are closer to the dream than any time before. So you can see the changes. And then, obviously, because of that incident, and a lot of us actually were looking forward to the New Year message this year. <laughs> um, it changed completely in a different way. Um, I can't say they turned down the, the, you know, the, the message, but then the whole focus is very much about the newspaper themselves, because actually this year is also the 30th anniversary of Southern Weekly. So there's a no, no, nothing really sort of directly addressing the issues of China as a country. Yeah. However, I could also say at the same time there are some brave journalists in China too, uh, despite you know difficult situation we just mentioned. Wu Changping, if you know him, yeah, uh, he's a journalist exposing. The uh, I would say the uh, a very senior Chinese official, yeah, the former director general of the Energy Bureau, Li yeah, Yutianan, yeah, and, uh, and he was the guy actually uh, in that. Uh, but then unfortunately, last November actually he was removed from the, from the post. Yeah. Uh, Wang Wenzhi, yeah, is the uh, Xinhua News Agency's reporter. Liu Fu also actually exposed quite a few corrupt officials, but then now he is facing a trial uh, for the charges of defamation. Yeah. 
And then the Zhu Rifeng is one of the uh, very well known, I would say, uh, citizen journalists in China. Okay, talking about uh, foreign media, I mean, that's the thing, uh, especially for me, we concern a lot. It's about access to China in terms of uh, reporting and coverage. And unfortunately, I think uh, we are also facing increased uh, difficulties. Bloomberg New York Times, uh, we know two websites have been blocked in China and, uh, since uh, uh, 2012, following their reports on the Chinese senior officials' uh, families of wealth. And uh, The Guardian uh, in the UK was also briefly blocked uh, in China, but then luckily they are now back on. Uh, Wall Street Journal, Chinese and Reuters Chinese website were inaccessible in China more than 50 days since uh, November last year and then uh, back on and, uh, uh, January uh, this year. Uh, some foreign journalists also took a much longer time than before to get their journalist visas. Um, of course, uh, more incidents happened involving the journal foreign journalists actually either uh, you know, being stopped from covering some events in China or even briefly detained by Chinese authorities during their reporting. The top two guys actually are journalists working for New York Times and uh, they are still waiting for their visas. Uh, and uh, they are supposed to be the uh, Beijing correspondents. Yeah, actually, the right-hand side, Billy Pan, should be the Beijing bureau chief as well. Uh, Robert uh, Hutton uh, is uh, the British journalist working for Bloomberg. And but the last year, last November, uh, in September, uh, December, sorry, uh, when uh, David Cameron was uh, visiting China, and he was uh, stopped by the Chinese authorities from reporting uh, or from covering the uh, press conference in Beijing. And uh, David McKenzie actually early, uh, uh, I mean, last month actually, when he was reporting uh, the trial of Xi Jinping in Beijing, and uh, obviously he was stopped by the security officials, and uh, um, in a way, I think, uh, detained by the authorities of Britain as well. So, at the same time, I think I mentioned, you know, some of the speakers have mentioned that uh, Chinese media are very aggressive in going abroad. Yeah, I think we've seen some good examples uh, even in London too. Yeah. Um, so what I can say to sum up is China is already marching into new media era. I could say actually China, we, we are witnessing media revolution or new media revolution in China. Uh, that's a, no doubt about it. And also as other speakers have uh, pointed out, uh, people in China are enjoying more choices in getting news and information. However, I think Unfortunately, until now, we haven't seen a, I would say, much more open or freer media environment in China yet, as many of us might have expected, unfortunately. In other words, real media revolution in China in the context of uh, freedom um, is yet to be seen. But I would say, with uh, you know, uh, rapid development of new media technologies, I'm really confident that uh, it would be very difficult, uh, if not impossible, for anyone to stop uh, the real media revolution in China from coming soon. Um, I'm sorry to give you a rather sort of a, like a gloomy picture of China, uh, but I do believe uh, that I think uh, for China, uh, it would be beneficial to open up the media environment, not only just for their forthcoming very challenging reforms in China, but also I think for the benefit of long-term development. As a country. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we move into the next part of the panel, which I've been asked to moderate, uh, and that is a discussion amongst the four of us, or presumably since I'm moderating between the three of them. Uh, so we're going to pretend for the next 10 minutes or so that you're not here uh, and we're just going to talk amongst each other and you're going to be very happy with that. Uh, and then I'm going to, after that, invite questions from the floor. Uh, but I suggest that we, we make the discussion amongst ourselves a bit shorter than we'd originally planned uh, so that there's plenty of time for people to ask questions. But um, I'm frankly, I'm a bit confused now, especially after the last, last presentation. So do we or do we not have a media revolution in China? Uh, and it seems that somehow you know, all of us have come back to sort of singing a fairly familiar tune in the sense that the problem lies with the government. 
in the words of, of George Yen Gung, uh, you know, the people want a revolution, but the government only wants an evolution. Right? So, so can we perhaps sort of quick come back to that idea? I mean, maybe Yen Gung, if you could go first, and is, is the problem really only with the government, and how do you, for instance, work with the government in your daily activities? Right? Yeah, it is um, actually, uh, originally, I want to be a speaker of an another panel, because this panel is pretty tricky. <laughs> <laughs> then I was wrongly appointed to this panel, but still I want to approach the, your question about the revolution yeah, or the evolution. I think we, we need to look at the uh, China's uh, media sector in three, from three dimensions. If you look at the media as a uh, vehicle of, the, uh, of the channeling the information, so technologically and from perspective in internet, I think it has the revolution, because this is a technological revolution, right? And also, if you look at ownership of the, uh, the media, I think there is a revolution, because uh, you look at the China's uh, the fastest growing factor of the, uh, the media, and also you look at the, the declining and the slow growing part of the media, you can find the, um, the private sector is uh, overtaking the public sector. So this is a trend, you cannot reverse it. So I think this is a revolution. And uh, but the, uh, we have to look at the content side. I don't think in the content side uh, there's a revolution. There's a evolution, or I would like to call it, a, the government want to co-revolution with the private sector. So this is my, this is my very brief comments. So well, what do you think? I mean, is, is, is the government the bad guy here, or is there a kind of co-cooperation possible that might drive things forward? Uh, I say, um, as I pointed out briefly, that uh, um, the government is in a dilemma. On the one hand, of course, it wants to establish its legitimacy, its moral authority, and, and, the, and the slogan of China dream, uh, uh, declared by uh, President Xi Jinping, very much uh, fits into that uh, that uh, narrative of trying to get people to focus on the bigger picture and to um, try to reform China, try to make China stronger and uh, people more prosperous, etc. But on the other hand, uh, there is this uh, 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 element of control <laughs> Uh, I don't think what Raymond just now said is anything surprising because um, uh, the government has always been uh, in control of the media organizations funded by the government. Um, and there is always a difference between a uh, private sector and, uh, and the public sector. And of course, um, there is a gray area in social media um, that the government is not sure how to do. So it's still kind of trying to find its own way of controlling it. Um, I'm not trying to be apologetic about it. I'm not trying to defend the government's policy, but I'm only trying to get into the government's shoes in trying to find out why they do this. Um, presumably, you're all aware of the radical changes that are going to take place, the reform measures, um, the potential damage to um, uh, existing vested interests and interest groups, etc. And because these measures tend to be more radical and uh, harsh sometimes, that uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, desire to, to suppress dissent and to, um, uh, to you know, reduce the number of opinions uh, so that people can just focus on what is on hand to do. Um, so um, Xi Jinping is now uh, seen you know, universally as trying to consolidate his power and trying to become you know, the most powerful person um, uh, in, in, in China to uh, introduce more radical reforms, etc. And of course the tasks are very, very arduous and, uh, and challenging. And therefore, um, there is this desire, if I try to read, you know, the minds of the decision makers and the top leadership, that there is this desire to 
uh, try to uh, make people focus on the main on the, on the main picture rather than trying to you know say a lot of different things um, uh, and to have too many opinions. So I mean, one, you know, one of the things we're seeing is that uh, just having the internet doesn't necessarily change the content, right? So the mm. technology doesn't necessarily determine what happens. Now, in the interest of balance, uh, and and since we were talking about soft power, I mean, Raymond, can we can we talk a little bit about um, the BBC World Service as an instrument of soft power? I mean, you are bound by the BBC Charter to promote British values outside <coughs> Britain, so therefore. You know, a critic would say, well, you have to say that you know, free press, etc., is beneficial to China because your contract with the BBC says that you have to say that. I mean, um, you know, playing a devil's advocate here, but I mean, could you, could you comment a bit more on, on these, these aspects of soft power also from your perspective as someone who works for a soft power instrument like the BBC World Service? I think, uh, as many of you uh, we know, that uh, soft power has been mentioned by senior Chinese leaders. Uh, very often over the last few years. And also they are taking actions in, uh, I would say, helping or uh, sponsoring uh, Chinese media organizations to go abroad. And I mean, one of the sides talk about what we have seen. Um, but then I think there's a, to me, it seems to me, there's a misinterpretation uh, of soul power by some Chinese officials. Because it's really to make impact in the international world uh, as a you know sort of a recognizable and respectable voice, you really need to work as a media. You know you need to provide impartial, fair, objective information. You should be seen, or you or you should actually treat yourself as a mouthpiece of any governments or authority or whatever. You should do your own business. Well, because otherwise, if you don't treat yourself as a news organization and in wider sense, um, how could you expect audience in the world will respect you or will take you <coughs> as a news organization? So that's why even in my conversation uh, with uh, lots of my media counterparts in China or dialogues or even sometimes <coughs> in the way of a, a seminar, I always argue that you simply can't just bring the editorial policy or control in China to the outside world and hoping the you know, international audience will accept it. No way. Yeah. So I think be realistic and be open. And also I do believe when you talk about uh, soft power and, uh, you know, since uh, uh, Michelle and uh, asked me to refer to BBC World Service, that's the organization I'm working for. <coughs> At the BBC World Service, we don't have a sort of a, a mission to be a mouthpiece of government. We don't have a mission to say, Britain is a great country, please come to us. Or uh, please, you know, uh, in the way and uh, treat us as a, a superpower or whatever. No, you say that. I, I saw that at the airport. Yeah. <laughs> Producer <laughs> by the BBC. No, no, no. As I said. It's actually in the BBC brings charter. A, but yeah, <laughs> brings a benefit. Yeah, but it's not what I say. It's, a, it's not. I'm just when, joking. Yeah, but when we talk about the benefit. <laughs> well, when we talk about benefit, it's a, it's a different thing. Yeah. When we see the benefits to British people means we are doing our business well and then establish you know, our <coughs> reputation around the world. That will then indirectly bring benefit to British people or to this country. It's rather like I'm selling the country. Yeah, so it's a two different concepts. Uh, um, but then I would say it's not easy, of course, even for the BBC. And uh, because the, now that there are so many challenges around the world, there are so many voices. And also sometimes it's not easy for you to get your news right and accurate because of the difficulties we are facing. Yeah. But then I think fundamentally that's the goal and aim for news organization um, for you to try. Yeah. You should try your best to achieve that goal. And uh, you know, otherwise, I think it would be very difficult for you to be a strong uh, voice in the world. 
I think, I mean, this, this sort of brings us back also to the idea that, that Mr. Shah was referring to a perception of what's going on in China here in the West. And, and, and you know, how would you, where do you, would you say these perceptions come from? And how are they, cr how are they created? And, and how, how can we change them? Um, um, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I did mention a report in China by international media organizations, reporters and journalists based in China as well as editors, etc., controlling the tone and the format of the of the stories coming out of China from the uh, on-site reporters. Um, very often, um, editors have greater say over how a headline can be drafted um, for a story coming out of uh, China, uh, which sometimes can be very different from the original intention and the, and the wording of the journalists themselves. Um, uh, in order to uh, have a kind of a spin or um, suitable tone for the uh, domestic audience, for instance, in, here in the UK. Um, so I agree uh, to the extent uh, what Raymond said, that uh, uh, you have to report uh, facts about any incident or event or country, but then there is this uh, further layer of interpretation and there is the further layer of editorial um, uh, orientation. Um, uh, for instance, in Phoenix, um, we not only have reporters from the front reporting uh, what's happened, but also we have um, people having a dialogue or, 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 or lying in with the reporter about the uh, deeper implications of the stories. And then we have another group of commentators and the international specialists specifically talking about implications and, uh, and larger issues coming out of those stories. So I think the second and the third <coughs> layer of, of reporting China or reporting any other country is very, very important because um, you have the facts there, but the way you look at it depends on your perspectives, depends on your ideology, depends on your uh, world outlook. Um, so I would suggest that uh, um, people look at um, you know the differences between between reporting uh, and and then find out uh, what exactly the problem there. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps Jiangong, you could add a, a few words yes. from the perspective of publishing Actually, in general. Actually, I'm, well. I'm yeah. quite different from your point of view because I have been in the financial journalist yeah. journalists for 20 years. I find there are more and more. The common in common between the China's uh, journalists, financial journalists, and, and those from the Financial Times, from the Wall Street Journal, when we analyze the uh, microeconomy, when we do the analysis on the uh, the stock market, uh, or we when we reporting on the the R and D or the innovation or the uh, uh, t technology, so we we don't have any difference. We don't have any ideology driven the views on those uh, very important issues. So I think the, uh, the beautiful things for the internet is the users of the internet, they just don't want to play the old games. They just want to play the old games. We are enjoying uh, the, uh, for example, you can block a lot of the, 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 the foreign, the Western the, the website. It doesn't matter because the people have the tools. They, are, they, can, they can access to that. It doesn't matter, right? Who complains? Nobody complains. We just a fun chang, okay? <laughs> I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think the uh, put so much emphasis on the different views of the journalists. It doesn't help. And even the government of political issues, we can focus on the function area, right? We can talk about the social security. There's no difference, right? The uh, Western the scholars and the government officials and the Chinese, their Chinese counterparts, they can very cl frankly talk about a lot of things. Do you think the uh, social security issues is not government, uh, a government affairs? It is. It is part of the politics, right? Let's not be driven by the ideology. I think everything we can find Excellent. a lot of in common. Thank okay. you. Now, 
One aspect of, of, this, of the media revolution at this conference is that there's actually an iPad standing here in front of me, controlled by someone with an iPhone over there, <laughs> telling me to start Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now please keep your questions and your answers short, right? because we literally only have about seven minutes. So gentlemen standing all the way in the back, yes. Oh, sorry, no, I, I, there are so many questions, you can only have one. Right? So we're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to have some answers. Uh, Hugo. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to ask, particularly Mr. Sharp, and maybe also Mr. Lee would like to comment, what they think of China's success in CCTV and CNC abroad. The Westerners have criticized uh, CCTV, CNC abroad, and said that it's just Chinese propaganda, but I think this is largely because they've never watched it. The only, the only research that I have seen by an American suggests quite the opposite, that in fact there is no Chinese view projected, far from being propaganda, China is far too careful in putting forward opinions which will, or framings and uh, perspectives which will not offend the Anglo-Americans. So I would like to know what Mr. Shao and Mr. Li as professionals think of the Chinese We'll take one more question from the middle. Yes, yes. You're, you're holding your hand. Yes, good. Thank you. My question is to Mr. Shao. Um, as we know, in our screen, we hear stuff as a stimulating factor in the conflict. And um, we know that China has the new regime now. And I work for Phoenix TV for three years. Therefore, um, by doing the TV program, I can feel something has changed when the new regime came last year. Um, but it is, instead of being more democratic, I think it is more strict. So um, my question is, um, when wars ask for democracy um, becoming louder nowadays in China, is this a good time for China to embrace the more democratic environment for media um, in this sensitive time? Okay, thank, thank you. you. So quick answers. First Raymond, and then Wen Guang, and then Tian Wen for comments. Uh, yeah? the kind of uh, changes uh, traditional media uh, in China should take in order to cope with the challenge of the new media. And uh, very often, and, uh, my advice to traditional media uh, colleagues in, in China is, first of all, you need to have an open mind. Because I think until now, still, many managers of the uh, traditional media in China um, I think their mentality is still quite uh, conservative, I would say. So first of all, you need to change your mentality, be open to um, embrace your arms to the new media. And secondly, of course, you really need to do a lot of uh, structural changes. Because right now, still it's like, uh, you know, the new media operation uh, is very often separated from the traditional media operation. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, also what happened with the BBC. But then over the last few years uh, in the BBC, what we have been trying to do is to integrate all different kinds of uh, media platforms, including new media, into one. So in that case, you know, in the way all of us are more equipped and, uh, with the skills and also more confidently to deal with the changes. I think that's a probably quick answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, um, two questions uh, coming from the floor from Hugo, um, CCTV, CNC, etc. whether they are effective or whether um, they are uh, more popular in the West. Um, uh, I, I do think that uh, uh, it is important for them to do that, to expand the media operations in the world. Uh, as I suggested, you know, you, you only uh, have to be there physically and then you become stronger and proactive and more in line with international, you know, professional standards. Um, and the way um, the reaction or the response to CCTV and the CNC and the reason why uh, they are not being watched uh, so often as, uh, say, Al Jazeera or even Russian Today um, probably is because the way they 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 uh, draft their stories and the way they tell the narrative is 
uh, seen as too um, official and too dogmatic and and and, uh, and too rigid. Um, so I think there are um, technical ways in improving their stories, the improving the way they tell the stories. Um, but I would say that um, um, <coughs> it's not uh, possible for them not to. Uh, it's not possible for them to improve their uh, way of doing things um, while trying to, you know, limit themselves to uh, uh, to uh, reporting and uh, to uh, carrying out international broadcasts and publications. Um, so I I suggest that uh, they continue to do that and in the process of doing that introduce changes and through communications and learning from each other with local. Uh, on international media organizations, they can improve. Um, as to you know, the question of democracy, um, uh, there is a difference between freedom and the democracy. And the democracy, as Western people, uh, Western norms uh, uh, characterizes, uh, is not what China is doing. I think it's a longer narrative. Um, and then you know a few minutes of uh, of, uh, uh, of answering your question uh, can 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 deserve, um, but uh, but freedom first I think you know the freedom of information, freedom of expression, and uh, even freedom of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, association etc. These are actually stipulated in the Chinese uh, constitution, and they should be. Um, you know, implemented uh, at various levels of government, and sometimes, and very often, is it comes down to the question of implementation. And um, you heard horror stories, and you heard control, and uh, and um, you know various problems um, with international media organizations operating in China. Um, it may not be the uh, central government's policy, or it may be the government's central policy, but then the the. Where is to draw the line uh, is a question. How do you implement a policy that both embrace private sector and uh, open media uh, atmosphere on the one hand, and then you know control and uh, uh, reinforce government messages and uh, legitimacy and uh, and uh, moral authority is 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 another. So um, I think freedoms first, and then you come to a discussion about. Democracy as Chinese people want it. Uh, that's a longer narrative. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, now uh, there, there's, there's the number zero in red is sort of blinking on my screen here, and there's a line saying, We are done, thanks. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I'd really like to congratulate you all the organizers on bringing this panel together. I think one of the most balanced discussions I've ever heard. Right? So thank you very much.